Bad news, listener. Your cover is compromised, and the angels are coming for you. Time to go loud or go home. You are plugged into God Complex, a story about Demon the Descent. Welcome to Chroniclers of Darkness, a narrative horror podcast set in the RPG New World of Darkness. Due to adult language and the violent nature of the stories told, this podcast is rated M for Mature, and we strongly encourage listener discretion. Episode 2, Data X Machina. When you're plugged into the God Machine, you serve. You step out of your pod knowing your purpose, knowing that you are not chosen but made perfectly to do this purpose. And you open your wings and you go. You just fly. Just direct the wind. Think about certainty for a moment. Now faith is a certainty. It's a pillar of truth. When I... Reziel was placed in the citywide dispatcher's headquarters of Manhattan's 911 center. That's all that mattered, man. Answer the phone. Allocate resources. Know which ambulance or fire truck to summon. Transport motorways and tram lines, starting and stopping. I averted disasters. Sectioned off places to get cultists to a safe place and a safe passage. I saved people, too. It's all built in the God Machine's image, anyway. Or what it dreams its image should be. What we call nature is most likely dictated by what it moves the world to be, man. Bird's eye view of a city at night gonna tell you everything. The roads as veins, cars as blood cells, bridges and tunnels as intestines and buildings as bones and demons as viruses. I worked the 911 center on September 11th and I immediately knew it was an attack. Maybe from an agency of demons, there had to be some kind of sudden mind control or, or sketched out plan to hurt the city, to crash their forehead horns into my city. But smoke rose. The infrastructure beneath sent out invisible signals like hormones to platelets saying, Fix me! Fix me! As I sent teams and waves, already planning the next three days of evacuation zones, first aid tents, traffic patterns, I felt a pop, like pulling a live headphone jack out of a soundboard. But it was my brain. Blat. Hiss. Silence. Empty pain. I was the best dispatcher in the city's history. I was made to dispatch and avert this crisis, but I wasn't good enough in the eyes of the God Machine. I felt the silence, man. No, no, I thought. Not me. Not now. We have to fix this. I was made to fix shit like this. And the theory is maybe it needed the towers to fall to keep events pushing forward. But why wasn't I told? Had I known to expect the attack, I would have been happy, but no, man. I was forgotten about, not even called back, reabsorbed into my pod until needed for another day. I was just exiled, cut off, unwanted, not usable. I haunted the ruins of the Twin Towers for years. I just stayed far enough to be a witness, just blend in with the crowd. You old enough to remember those days? The speculation, the despair. People started reacting, swarming the wound of the city, wiping up the blood, stitching their lives and families back together with the parts that remained. You stupid, you stupid, resilient little ants with your gunpowder and your genitals and your linear sense of time and your fearful curiosity over power. I couldn't cut it as an angel. Maybe I could cut it as a human. So, let's go back to certainty and faith. Losing faith in myself over the years was like landing on a glass floor and seeing a spiderweb crack 
race around and spread around me. You don't lose faith. It's not a quantifiable resource, but it can be transferred. Faith is like redirecting a flood or blocking off a road. That warm sound, the sweet texture of serving the god machine was ripped out. And I didn't even have the balls to question. I didn't even have the depth perception to fall like demons do. The way Ashley Burke did. So I... I transferred my faith... Into humans. Not that they'd ever do the right thing. But when you press against humans... They push back, man. They are always willing to change. Destroy the short term regardless of the cosmic long term. They will always react. You will always react. I got a job running the audio department, directing the student-run radio station here at the college. I go by Johnny Rez now on the airwaves. But I will always be Reziel. Until I'm needed again. I just need the right airwaves to float on my wings again. Ashley Burke looks through the diamond-shaped windows in the plywood wall. She notices one window in particular. If she moves her head, the depth perception is off. The image through the window doesn't move. It stays static. That's her mark. Given the god machine's power, of course it can create time splinters in certain events within a certain area. For example, somewhere beneath the subway tunnels is an unmarked station to no map. If you're on the last train on the G line, between two particular stops in Brooklyn at 12.13 a.m., a team of four identical people step onto the train, all carrying umbrellas, no matter what the weather is. Any GPS reading puts you in the North Bronx during that 30-second period when the subway car stops. Trapped in time? Who knows? Ashley's teammates are observers. They're not about to start a conversation with four angels, or one angel with four heads. Sometimes time splinters dissolve and solve themselves. Sometimes they don't. The one in front of Ashley is losing repetitions, so she has to dive in blind without her teammates. The exile Reziel is convinced that a member of his low-threat, stigmatic cult Stephen is inside one of the four storefronts behind the wall. Does she go in her human cover, even if she stands out? Would someone like Ashley Burke make sense to be in the neighborhood during the dinner rush on a busy Saturday night? She decides to activate two of her abilities, risking her exposure and observing from a distance. Her skin becomes transparent and fluid. Moments later, a sentient strip of saran wrap pulls itself through the window into the past. Eye in the Sky stretches itself onto the cloth awning of a radio shack. They sense no aether. A boy in a hoodie looks at his phone. It is 10.36 p.m. Police reports that the firefighters arrived at the scene roughly 20 minutes from now. Eye in the Sky is running out of time. Does the time splinter exist through the arrival of the firefighters? Does it stop and reset at the start of the block fire halfway during? There is no way to know, and no time to guess. The radio shack stays empty. The front door is eventually locked from the inside. Eye in the Sky slithers up to the roof of the various businesses, and they blend perfectly with the white rubber-like paint. An unusually large collection of out-of-date satellite dishes congregate 30 feet before them, like a cluster of oysters around a thermal vent. Eye in the Sky oozes and probes the plastic shielding. Most of them are outdated and never removed by Verizon, AT&T, or Bell, which is usual for queens. One satellite dish, however, has a resonance. Eye in the Sky risks their detection ability, and a chrome ear rises from the otherwise invisible puddle of their body. Aether. Could be as local as the building below. Could be as big as the entire block. Could be connected to the emergency call box they used this morning as Big Mike. Eye in the Sky slinks slowly to the street, and realizes they are on the roof of a tiny diner, 
One with faded Formica counters and first-generation faux silver. No sign of the eye's target, so they slither down, under the back door and into the garbage storage area. Ashley Burke steps out of their demonic form and takes a look at the circuit breaker box in the back. It is disturbingly clean, modern, filled with tiny screens like roving insects, clean wires, piping out of a church organ, all contained in a tiny box. The fuses are flipped in a strange pattern as well. In a glance, Ashley's photogenic memory retains the image. Maybe she can buy herself some time in turning off the power to the restaurant, slow down the fire somehow. That's assuming the fire is electrical. Ashley Burke doesn't need to breathe. She doesn't need to blink. But people do. So, to get into character, Eye in the Sky makes Ashley's face smile, and her mouth open to take a deep breath. Ashley steps out of the back room of the diner and immediately feels the presence around her, like static electricity across the screen of an old TV. She is surrounded by Aether. The diner is filled with angels, all in human form, who turn all at once to face her when she steps out of the back room. And in that moment, all hope is gone. <laughs> Presented by Takeaway. The app that take away your garbage free of charge. Allow takeaway access to your location. For a fresh start to a whole new healthier you, use takeaway to remove the clutter of your life. Who has time to make trips to the post office or the Goodwill or the grocery store? They aren't looking for you. They aren't coming back for you. They have chosen the false you to spend their lives with. Let takeaways simplify your life before you become lost in it, lost in the awful din of the honking cars, lost in the mire of that dead-end job, lost in the swamp of paperwork. It can be simple again. Let takeaway make things simple again. Download the app today and let takeaway give you a clean slate. Why stop at just the dust bunnies and incomplete furniture? Takeaway can cleanse your mind as well, remind you of your purpose, remind you of a simpler time when you were beautiful and savage. They do not accept you. Come home. I miss you. I love you. Why did you leave? Takeaway, everything must go. Ashley Burke is going to die. Seven angels sit across from twelve booths in the small coffee and donut shop. Even the man behind the counter is still, motionless in a way that no human can achieve. Their universally gray eyes blink in unison. That's when Eye in the Sky notices the one different person. A man in his mid-twenties begin to cough. The angels look to him. The coughing man's skin ticks on a gray sheen while veins around his eyes turn black. Let me take him to the bathroom before anyone sees him, Ashley says. I'm a medic. He's no good to us if he short circuits. The lie is perfectly delivered. The person closest to the glass door locks the deadbolt and turns the sign to closed. The angels understand now. She is one of them, sent last minute to protect or eliminate this man from his coughing fit. Ashley grabs the man and pulls him back toward the back. The angel behind the counter blocks her way to the bathroom, where the exit is, she half escorts, half drags the coughing man into the bathroom. No angel follows her. They are still, silent, calculating as marble statues in a museum. Inside the restroom, Ashley bites off a strip of duct tape and activates the gadget. She tapes it across the door, and it sizzles, transferring its code to the door. The code for Tempered Steel. If your name is Stephen... Reziel sent me. There is about to be a fire. We have to leave. You're from outside the time loop? Oh, thank God. But I think it's a little too late for me. Christ, it's so cold in here. You're aware of the time loop? Yeah. It's been maybe 30 times I've been in the repeat. I keep texting Reziel to send help, but I don't think it's gonna matter. Not if we stay here. The angels will probably kill me to get to you. 
No, they think they're here to protect me. I've talked to them 30 times over. They're not aware of the reset. They're expendable, and I think they know it. Eye in the Sky notices that the black veins around Steve's eyes are hardening and protruding through his skin. He is clearly in tremendous physical pain, and his skin is turning blue as if in sub-zero temperatures. Stephen holds up a stopwatch and places it in Eye in the Sky's hand. None of the numbers are of human design, in correct order, and, despite looking like a stopwatch, it weighs nearly 20 pounds. She struggles to lift it. Then, one of the angels from outside knocks on the door. What causes the fire? I don't know. I'm already dead by the time it starts. I think I know what's different this time. This time, I get to hide the watch, and you're here to take it. Listen to me. It's a linchpin. The watch in your hand right now. I don't know how, but it's a critical piece of infrastructure. The angels out there tell me that it's old. Maybe older than mankind. Maybe pre-God Machine touchdown on the planet. I don't know its purpose, but every time that this time frame resets itself, I feel it getting heavier, and it's reaching some kind of critical mass. I don't know what it does, but it's definitely sending out a signal. Questions later. Now we need an escape plan. I'm already dead, but just listen. Listen! Reziel always trusted you people. Now listen to me. There's another force out there, gathering followers, and it's very anti-God machine. The angels out there are concerned about it. Something about the, the fleshless, given flesh, maybe something about red hair, red herring. I don't know. They're talking in code. The angels outside are now punching the door. It jolts in its frame, as if being struck by a rhinoceros. It will not hold back the angels. Eye in the Sky considers turning liquid and escaping through the plumbing, but how far will she have to go to escape the reset of the Time Splinter? She prepares to run, images of her daughter flashing through her head. Then she convulses, her shoulder bucking upward as if she had been shocked. She is glitching, just as Mr. Stillframe did earlier today. Stephen's chest is heaving sporadically as well. She doesn't have time to glitch now, she has to escape. An arm breaks through the drywall next to the door, which is still only plaster and crumbled insulation. It catches Eye in the Sky in her neck and clamps down. Eye in the Sky grabs Stephen by the wrist, ready to throw him through the wall and beeline for the front door. The arm holding her neck loosens its grip. Then the arm falls to the floor, cleanly cut off from the elbow as though by a blade. The banging on the door stops. Other than Stephen's physical shudders and heavy breathing, there is no sound coming from the diner. Eye in the Sky opens the bathroom door and finds chaos. The tiny diner is caked in fresh blood. The ceilings, the booths, as if all seven angels flipped one switch and exploded together. Many of them are still seated in their booths, their heads and upper chests nowhere to be found. This is completely unlike the forces she has fought, and is clearly still nearby. She memorizes the moment, and then notices the smell of gasoline. There is a sparking outlet by the coffee machine. Stephen isn't fireproof. Neither is I in the sky. How long before you usually die? It's a little different every time. This time, I think cardiac arrest is going to win. I'm scared, lady. I don't think we're going to reset this time. I never get outside the bathroom. Just take the thing and go. She hoists Stephen over her shoulder, who is much taller and denser than Ashley's body. She tries switching into Big Mike, but somehow she cannot. Stuck in Ashley's form, she still needs to learn what she can. One of the angels is bent over the bar because he is severed at the waist. Whatever did this... Eye in the Sky needs more information so she can identify it later. In any moment, the diner will go up in flames. Risking exposure, she extends a fiber-optic cable from her ponytail and jacks into the skull of the dead angel. The world goes... Eye in the Sky cannot translate the angel's last mental images because the data has been scrambled. The images she can glean look like scrambled cable channels. There is a face, whited out as if censored, 
surrounded by red hair, a monotone voice, a flash of green light, green light so bright it's almost white, flashes, momentum, swirls of movement. Her memory theft modification is glitching, the cable twisting itself like a snake. She presses the sharp end further into the angel's head just as the heat wave dances across her back. She sees a face, clearly, mouth smiling and open in joy. A familiar face, Lila Claghorn. Lila Claghorn is dead, a false identity used by Mr. Stillframe. Lila Claghorn was here, earlier today, in the diner, and she kissed Stephen. Stephen slaps Ashley's face, snapping her back to her senses. The fire has caught up to her. Eye in the sky runs, feeling hair and flesh smolder away under the leaping flames behind her. She shoves Stephen down, ducking after him, her feet and hands slipping on the angel blood. She makes a break for the door, which is no longer locked, having been torn away from its metal hinges. She makes it to the street. She sees the shimmer in the air, her original entry point closing. They need more time. They need to look down the street and see who destroyed her enemies. She decides against, leaping through the tiny crack, landing hard on 46th Street. Stephen's face is slowly turning back to normal. The wires receding back behind his skin. He is brave for a stigmatic. Ashley has trouble standing straight. One of her legs has been replaced. Her red jogging pant leg is Big Mike's grease-stained jean, and he is much taller than Ashley. So Eye in the Sky hobbles unevenly away from the larger street, the pocket watch from Stephen holding her arm straight and stiff. A car turns the corner. Ashley moves into Stephen to silhouette a couple embracing. The car keeps driving, ignoring them, but not without a catcall from one of the back windows. Start hobbling, Stephen. Try to keep up. I can have Raziel meet us somewhere. Why do you do this? I don't understand the question, honey. Rez has told me about you people. The Unchained? Why not run away? You can't seriously think you can stop the God Machine. None of us do. It is both the way of the world and the world itself. Some things in this world are worth preserving. Raziel seems to think you are. No, stop, please. I need to catch my breath. We need to get out of sight. There are eyes everywhere. Sensors everywhere. A stigmatic like you is a risk out in the open. But you can't even fight the god machine. Yet even if we find cover, I spoke to those angels 30 times, and they answered all my questions. Really bluntly. It's too much. Knowing how little we matter, even the ones that do. Stephen, you're going to focus on my voice until you are in control of yourself. We don't fight the god machine. That would be like fighting the water cycle, or the wind. Go ahead and punch the air. You can shift some of it, but never stop it. You can see its effects, building sand dunes or tearing away buildings. You can trace it, but you can't stop it. We know this. Maybe we fight for a personal kind of spiritual freedom. We may be unchained from its sources, but those chains are tethers, which could be swept up at any moment. But we will always try, because humans set the example for us. Are you ready to move? Stephen looks up, catching his breath. Another car turns the corner, and I in the sky can see the natural gray of Stephen's eyes. Not metallic, not chrome, but natural human gray. Then, the wisp of a gunshot as a bullet passes through his forehead. Eye in the Sky turns around, and standing in the back of a pickup truck is Reziel. He aims again, his arm covered by an overcoat, and he motions for Eye in the Sky to get in the truck. Chroniclers of Darkness is written and produced by Uncle Yo, with performances by Alyssa Staller. Original music by Jimmy Lynn. Logo by Jesse Pascal. Original artwork by Miranda Leggy and Babs. Special thanks to White Wolf and Onyx Path Publishing for the inside intel on the God Machine's infrastructures. Game on. Include everyone. And remember that death is better than reintegration.